Hello and welcome to Ball on Politics live on KMTV. Well, we couldn't afford to take a trip to Florence, so we're hunkered down in our studio in Medway to reflect on the week's political news. On the agenda is the state of the NHS in Kent and Medway and whether there's a crisis, and if there is, what might be the cure. And it's party conference season, the time when party activists get the chance to hog the limelight and party leaders get the chance to make weak jokes. We'll also be looking at the promises made by Theresa May in her flagship's flagship speech today. With me on the sofa to discuss these issues are Anthony Hook, Liberal Democrat County Councillor from Faversham, and Dr Julian Spinks, the Vice Chairman of the Kent Local Me Medical Committee. Thanks to both for joining us. First, it's not been a good week for the NHS in Kent. One chief exec left his job. There was criticism of a private ambulance service used by hospitals and a company providing out-of-hours services for GPs in East Kent terminated its contract. To cap it all, a veteran Kent MP warned that his local hospital might even close because of a lack of EU nationals. Let's have a look at the figures. It's the figure we heard over and over. Vote leave and we'll get back £350 million for the NHS. Now, a year after that, the realities of mid-Brexit Britain are starting to hit hospitals in Kent. More than 400 staff from the EU have quit their hospital jobs in the run-up to and after the Brexit vote. There are also 670 unfilled nurses' jobs at hospitals run by three trusts in the county. And health chiefs and nursing leaders say Brexit made recruiting staff even more difficult, largely because of the uncertainty surrounding the status of EU nationals. So the direct sort of abuse and, and unpleasantness towards people has, has certainly died down. But what has continued is, the, because it has continued, the uncertainty of what Brexit will bring. The reliance on overseas staff in the NHS is underlined by separate figures showing that Kent's three hospitals together still have more than 1,100 on their payroll, with the Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells Trust accounting for more than half. Well, well Julian Spinks, you must have seen crises come and go in the NHS. How bad is this one in Kent? I have to say, um, from the coalface view, uh, being a GP, it does look pretty bad at the moment. Um, uh, we have crisis upon crisis really we've got problems uh, in hospitals we've got problems out in general practice where I work and compounding that is things outside the NHS like social care which means we can't get patients back to their own homes and in fact people need to be admitted simply because there isn't anyone to care for them at home all of that's a really big problem for us and what's the solution you know what's your remedy for these ailments that the NHS is suffering is there one solution or not we've heard a lot about the STPs these long-term plans are they a cover for cuts in the NHS or are they realistic modelling for the future? I think it's an attempt to square a circle. Um, the NHS has to make cuts. Uh, the plan for the uh, NHS, the five year forward plan, um, suggested that we needed about £30 million more money to run the NHS if we kept running it the way we did. Um, but they felt that we could save £22 billion of that with the other eight billion coming from the government. That's an enormous amount to cut. And so that means that uh, we are stretched as far as money is concerned. Uh, to add on to that, uh, things like staff wages meant we can't recruit. So uh, about a third of GP practices don't have uh, on, on, replacement doctors. On the, on the coal face, as you describe it, what are the kind of things that you're do, having to do now that you haven't previously had to do? Is it a question of uh, rationing treatments, limiting uh, treatments for non-essential ops? There's always been a degree of that, but the thing I've seen it shifting to is from the, um, the sort of luxuries within it, so things like cosmetic surgery and so on, but it's now moving into the mainstream. Uh, as of this week, I can no longer refer for orthopaedic surgery or physiotherapy without having a pre-approval system. That's never happened before. That sounds like bureaucracy again, in, intruding into the, into the system, not giving you the, the powers, the autonomy you perhaps would like. It, it, it's likely because they have the false assumption that somehow GPs refer unnecessarily. What they don't realise is, if anything, we're holding back mm. demand. And by making us go through pre-approval, it's just delaying things. It'll be interesting to see how many people ultimately they actually bounce back and what happens to those people because if I can't refer for treatment what do I do? Anthony Hook, uh, I'm guessing you're probably seeing some of these issues uh, mm -hmm. brought to you by constituents. What is your sense of the condition of the NHS? 
think he's under a lot of pressure and I've got friends and family working in the NHS as well who describe exactly the same situation. Last general election, the Liberal Democrats pledged to raise income tax by one penny to raise... Yeah, I mean, is that, the, is that the solution, more money? Is that just... A, or that seems quite a simpl simplistic kind of solution, just throw more money at it. Labour did this in the mm. 1990s and t early 2000s. Well, we've always been told by the Conservatives that you can just run it more efficiently, but actually we've seen the evidence time, time and time again that, that cuts are now really hurting. There's only so much fat you can turn away from an organisation before you're starting to cut in a way to muscle. We've got a, a shortage of doctors, nurses, other professions all allied to medicine in the NHS. That's because of the pay cuts, that's because Brexit is deterring staff from other countries to come to work here. So we need that investment in, in resources to well, make that, sure we've got more people. Well that does touch on what one MP, a Conservative mm. MP, was warning this week. He was suggesting, and I, you know, maybe a bit of sabre rattling, that a hospital might, his local hospital in mm. Margate might have to close because of the lack of EU nationals working. And let's, let's have a look at what he said. So never mind the highly qualified consultants, others were to leave the hospital was shut. I mean, it, it, Julian, you know, perhaps you'd like to say, is that really something which uh, represents a real danger or is it just a bit of kind of uh, pol political saber rattling? It's amazing how much the NHS actually depends on non-English trained staff, right from the sort of porters and cleaners up to the top consultants. We've imported these staff for years because we haven't trained enough locally. The problem we have is trying to replace people coming in because, for example, for uh, training a doctor, you're looking at perhaps a 10-year lead time mm -hmm. from increasing recruitment to actually getting people fully trained. So, yes, there could be real, real problems. We've seen this exodus of people, whether whether it's to do with it, Brexit or other things, and we're not being able to replace them. There's been a lot of criticism, Andrew, of the uh, Anthony, I beg your pardon, of the, um, the the new English language test that would be uh, employees in the NHS uh, will have to take and qualify, and that some of the figures are quite alarming in terms of the failure rate. Do you think that needs looking at again? It does need looking at because I, I've never, uh, in all times I've been a councillor and before that uh, a candidate and involved in other ways. Coming, when you get casework, I've had residents say, I've got a problem with the NHS, but uh, English language, I don't think I've ever had that come up. The problems are, I, I'm waiting too long for my operation, I can't get an appointment to my GP. I've never had someone um, say to me that they went to see the doctor and the doctor couldn't understand them at all. So I suspect that's a bit of distraction, a bit of um, trying to divert people away from it, real problems. I, I don't know if you've seen these <laughs> tests, uh, Julian, but they seem unnecessarily hard. One nurse complained that they had to virtually write an essay of, of an A-level standard in order to pass the test. Yes, it's difficult. They, they've set a high standard because they feel that communication is very important and that just speaking English isn't enough. You able to, you need to be able to speak medical English. That's fair enough, though, isn't it? Which I is mean. absolutely fair, but it is adding to problems. But worse than that, actually, people who are English-speaking coming into the UK are having trouble. I have colleagues who've been abroad for a few years, try to come back, get back into the job, and it's a real uphill struggle to actually be allowed back on the so-called performers list to actually be a GP again. Uh, Anthony, you were talking about you know the investment that the Liberal mm. Democrats have put in. What else would the party do, though, other than just? Put, I don't even know if the penny on income tax is still a policy, or you. It, it still is a policy, and it would raise six billion. And uh, neither of the other two main parties made any commitment in that direction, which I think is really disappointing. I think it's also important that you're honest with people, because it's easy to say, yeah, we'll, we'll chuck lots of money in, but parties need to be honest about how they're sourced that, and we were in terms of a penny on income tax. Something else we uh, debated at the party conference at Bournemouth was the issue of, of mental health, and, and everyone now quite rightly talks about how that's important. Um, but Norman Lamb, our health spokesman, was a minister in the coalition government, he actually did a lot for mental health, and we're, we're planning specifics. So one of the very specific things we discussed at Bournemouth was giving tax breaks to companies who put in place things within their own workplace to support the mental health of their employees. That, that sounds a, you know, a good proactive type of measure. Do you support that kind of thing, Julian? Absolutely. Uh, about one in five people I see are for mental health issues mm. in general practice, and it is difficult to get therapy. Some groups particularly bad, particularly things like children and adolescents, I find, struggle to get them referred into services to get uh, care that they need. Uh, I mean, if, if these therapies aren't available, they presume the problem's going to get worse. But you, you, know, you, you earlier were saying how you're having to sort of ration and limit other uh, treatments. How are you going to be able to provide these extra mental health services? 
well money has been earmarked for that, although I have to say there were figures showing that a lot of uh, clinical commissioning groups were not actually spending all the money they've been allocated yet. And again, we've got problems about staffing, which is, means that we can't actually get the services up and running as quickly as we could. OK. Uh, let's uh, move on to what Theresa May was saying in her flagship speech in Florence, where we're not, unfortunately, uh, and some of the uh, commitments she's making. She's talking about uh, the country not leaving Europe, her familiar phrase, two-year transition period after March 2019 while a permanent trade deal is worked out and payments were 20 billion euros to be made over two years. Some of these things obviously suggest they're making offers that they hadn't previously had to make. I mean, mm. presumably you think that uh, the EU states won't come up with some kind of universal agreement on whatever... We don't know exactly how Brexit is going to work out, but it, it's, it's just astonishing what it's really proved when people like Boris Johnson were telling Kent to vote Leave, we could, quote, have our cake and eat it. This was nonsense from beginning to end. They said we'd not have to make any payments. You're, you're promising a second referendum now, aren't you? Well, a, a first referendum on the new situation that will... No, not a rerun, not a repeat of the referendum what, we've already had. The, the facts... At the you, first referendum and how do you know facts, what those facts exactly. are going to be? Well, exactly. We don't at the moment. But when the exit deal is drafted, when it's published so that you, I, all of us can read it for ourselves, we'll then know what the reality of leaving will be like. What will we lose and what will we gain? And we're, instead of speculating, which, of course, was a big part of the last year's campaign, we'll all be able to see it and we'll be able to decide, is this a better future or actually would our better be future be by staying in? OK, well, when we come back, we'll continue that discussion. Uh, by putting the Liberal Democrats under the microscope a little bit more as their new leader promises voters a second go at something or other. Don't go away. Welcome back to Paul on Politics Live on KMTV with guests Anthony Hook and Dr Julian Spinks. Now, the Liberal Democrats kicked off the party conference season this week with their leader, Vince Cable, promising what appeared to be an offer of a second Brexit referendum, which Anthony is now going to tell me is not the case. But how is the party faring in Kent? Cameron Tucker reports. After three years of being leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg became Deputy Prime Minister during the coalition government. During Clegg's time in government, he oversaw an increase in tuition fees, even though the Lib Dems had promised not to. The party felt their electorate's anger when, in the 2015 general election, they lost 49 seats, and Nick Clegg stepped down as leader after what he called a cruel and punishing night. During the same year, a fresh-faced Tim Farron beat veteran Norman Lamb for the leadership, and he led a pro-European charge in the run-up to the referendum on Britain's membership of the EU. Fast forward just a year and Mr Farron left his job claiming that it was impossible to remain leader and keep his faith in Christ after criticism of his views on gay rights and other traditionally liberal issues. So out with the new and in with the old, veteran cabinet minister Sir Vince Cable was elected unopposed as leader of the Lib Dems this July. The 74-year-old leader set out his vision for the party during this week's conference. Only the Liberal Democrats have the ideas the experience, the commitment to transform the fortunes of our country. An exit from Brexit, a grown-up approach to the economy, and bold ideas to strengthen our society through the 21st century. But have people forgiven the party for their time in coalition, and are they aware of their new leader? We took to the streets of Medway to find out. Vince Cable. He's the leader of the Liberal Democrats. No idea at all. Do you? No. No. Um, I guess maybe a politician, but I wouldn't know who or what party. I've got no clue. No clue whatsoever. I don't know. Mate, I couldn't even tell you. I've never seen that man in my life. It looks like Vince Cable. <laughs> no, I have no idea who that is at all. Is uh, it an MP? I think he's uh, working with the conservative people. Is he the conservative? No, I don't know who he is. Vince Cable, the yeah. leader of the Lemon Democrat Party. No. No. Not a clue. No. An MP? Maybe? 
for no. them? I'm just guessing an Charity MP. Funder, Where's the suit? Maybe? Whatever. Other than that, no. Sorry. i am not going. Well, Anthony, uh, mixed views there, as you often find in not really a scientific survey, but it does mm. suggest that the Lib Dems are perhaps operating in the shadows a little bit. What does it need to do to get out of the shadows and make connections with voters? I think as people see Vince, they'll really like him. Obviously, he's been out of politics for two years before coming back in the snap election. So actually, the fact that roughly, I think it was 50-50 of the people you spoke to, I think there in Medway, could name him is actually a really good start, given he's been off the field of play for this time. So I think our job is to introduce Vince to people and I think as people get to know him as they see him on TV on the radio and the newspapers or even meet him more close up they will think he is smarter and more honest than any politician they've ever met. I know you've been down at conference mm -hmm. it, it didn't strike me as a particularly uh, energized uh, uh, conference. So, I mean, uh, lack of specifics in terms of policy proposals is that because he wants to set his own stamp on the party? Or? Well, it was it was a big conference. I mean, record attendance, more more registrations than the, the party's ever had in its whole history. Uh, so there were a lot of people there, and there were some uh, specifics. The uh, commitment to a further referendum on Europe was was made very clear. Uh, policy on increasing the pay for people in the armed forces, because at the moment they're having a real terms pay cut. The work for people suffering mental health problems that I talked about. But I think you're right. In general, Vince wants to set out a general approach, uh, and now will be the time to to, to build up more detail. I mean, you, you your problem is, and it's the same for all political parties, is that the whole political dynamic is being dominated by Brexit. So yes. you, you can't move for Brexit. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest issue facing the country, but it's not the only thing. And I actually think it's, it's very important for the party to talk about Brexit in the context of other issues. So we want a better NHS. We can talk about how we'll do that, part of which we'll be talking about the effect that Brexit is having on the but NHS. Where, where are the specifics on this? You know, where, where, when are you going to come forward with very specific things that voters are going to say, well, that's a Liberal Democrat policy. Yeah, well, obviously there are some at the moment. We're the only party with a specific commitment to put a specific amount of money extra into the NHS and how we'd, we'd pay for that. And, and I think we've got time to um, develop our ideas, develop Vince's ideas for a stronger economy and, and a fairer society. And I think people really like what Vince has to, to offer. Julian, do you, do you think there should be a more consensual approach to the challenges facing the NHS by the political parties? It's often used as a political football by the parties, you know, particularly when Blair and, the, uh, and Labour in power and the Conservatives uh, were in opposition. Yeah, I, I would love to see that because uh, you know we've got a five-year forward view. We need a 15-year or a 20-year forward view uh, and not have a situation where every time we come to an election, the NHS gets reorganised. Yeah. Uh, well, otherwise politicians you can't meddle, it. don't they? I mean, they, they come yeah. to power and they think, well, now in power, I better do something. But you're saying, well, let's press the pause button. They, they want to make a difference. The trouble is they, re they need to realise that actually looking at a longer term view of things, they will make a difference. Trying to do it all in five years and then have someone undo it after that, it's not going to work. And so we've talked about these long term plans, the sustainable transformation programmes, if I've got it right. Mm. Uh, and they seem quite messy and big things and, and very little for people to get hold of what they actually mean. Yeah. What's your view of these SDPs? I mean, do you think it's time to sort of scrap them, maybe start start again? Yeah, I mean, we were promised by the Conservative government no top-down reorganisation of the NHS, but we've had the very opposite of that. And I think these confusing uh, names, these long lists of acronyms and like alphabet soup are just, uh, a lot of time, are deliberately to obscure people and to make it unclear uh, what's actually going on. And particularly um, in my area of Faversham, the attacks on Canterbury Hospital are a massive concern to people because um, what is proposed is to take away most core services from Canterbury and require people to travel to Margate or to Ashford, which from Faversham, for instance, is an extremely long way to go. So people are very, very concerned about this. I, I didn't realise that Kent apparently has got a clinical senate, which I've never heard of before. But uh... Yes, there's, there's an awful lot of these organisations, including the SDPs, which are almost under the radar. And I can't understand why they don't actually make it more open to the public and to the people providing the services with the STP process. It took a long time for the local medical committee was actually involved in that. And we're now starting to work on it. But they made a plan without actually consulting the people who know how to do the work. Ign ignoring the people at the coalface. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, moving on to finish that discussion, we, we started with about Theresa May and Brexit. Uh, I mean, what would your bet be on her surviving up until 2019? Do you think there's a chance she will, or uh, the Conservatives love 
tearing themselves apart over Europe. They do from time to time. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but actually, in a way, I, I'm less bothered about whether Theresa May stays or goes to what the policy is. And my view is that if Brexit happens, we need to stay in the single market and the customs union to keep Kent's economy moving, to keep trade on the same basis, which the Leave campaign promised. But she she said today that's not going to happen. Is business, yeah, it? and I think it's it's deeply, deeply wrong because um, whether we stay in the single market wasn't on the ballot paper. I think people weren't given a clear choice about that. And I think it's going to be hugely damaging to our economy. We heard last week that a lorry from the EU takes two minutes to come through the port of Dover. A lorry from outside takes 20 minutes. Now, if every Quickly, lorry... Uh, Julian, uncertainty affecting staff shortages? Or Absolutely, country? staff shortages. It's starting to impact research as well. Um, and even things like we're going to lose the agency which decides uh, on safety of medication because that's currently in the UK. That will be taken mm. back to Europe and we have to replace. So there's lots of things where there's enormous uncertainty. It doesn't help at all. Mm. OK. Well, after that, let's move on to discuss names. What's in a name? What do Boris, Nigel and Vince have in common? Well, they are all names that do not appear in the most popular names given to children born in 2016. So does that tell us anything about high-profile politicians perhaps not being role models for parents? We took to Rochester High Street to see what people think about baby names. The, your, your Violets and your Emilies and your Lilies are going to stay. Um, I don't think you're going to say so many Kylies uh, or, or, or Britneys, uh, obviously, because they were they were only became fashionable because of the pop stars, and now that's a, sort of kind of a thing of the past. Matilda, Mildred, Sophia will probably die out. I think I like the name Anastasia. Yeah, I don't, that's a really I don't nice think name. I think things like Sharon and Tracy maybe will go. Ones I wouldn't choose are. Um, probably royal names, Harry or Charles or something like that. Abbreviated names are becoming more popular than they used to be. For example, I have a great nephew who's just been born and he's been called Ted. I think the really old ones might start coming back again. I, mean, I think there'll be a lot more sort of Bettys and things. They're all very cute and ditzy and dotty. I think that's another one that's starting to come back around. Well, Julian, did your parents name you after some famous medic, knowing that perhaps you'd become a, a GP in time? They were both teachers, but um, I, they told me they, they wanted to pick a name which couldn't be shortened, which meant throughout my life people had come up with weird and wonderful shortened versions of my names. Um, Julian was, was very popular around the time I was born. Um, about half the boys in my class in infant school were called Julian. Uh, but five years later, it just disappeared, and it doesn't seem to be coming back. Um, I'd rather like to have some more Julians coming along than not my own age, but I'm not holding my breath, I'm afraid. Uh, Anthony, would you like to see Nigel's coming back? I don't think Nigel will be coming back anytime soon, and I don't think there will be that many Borises either. But of course, Boris is not Boris's real name. His real name is, is Alexander, and I think he just calls himself Boris um, as a sort of projector kind of uh, profile. Um, and he, he's got seven or eight different names to, to choose from uh, in all. Um, my pa parents don't don't seem to think political. Uh, Political people are good. No, people I mean we, have, we haven't had you know a generation of Winstons or Clements and, or Marlins or Tonys or, or, or Tonys. Although apparently in Kosovo there's there's lots of Tonys uh, because of Tony Blair. Okay, well I'm afraid we've got to end the discussion there. Times against us. That's all from us here at Paul on Politics. Thanks to our guests for coming into the studio. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, you can catch up on all the latest political news by logging on to kentonline.co.uk or following me on Twitter at Paul on Politics. Thanks for watching. Oh, 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 oh,